It says starting recording. Okay, it's got to. Uh, it has to. Okay, it's going. We are on the air. So uh, hello and welcome to the show that doesn't have a name yet. And I am your host, Panyo Basa, sometimes also known as David Reynolds. And this is my host, who goes by the name of Numa, who uh, used to go by the name of Fiery Logos on Minds, but. Uh, we are living in a culture where names are very impermanent. So you are Numa now. That is correct. So um, Haire, that's my intro, uh, basically means hail in ancient Greek. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was like, I remember uh, reading a long time ago, a bunch of ancient like Greek letters that start off with, you know, so-and-so to so-and-so, Chiron, right? That's yeah. like, means like greetings or something. You don't start yeah, with deer, which is just that kind would of... be the Greek greeting, whereas salve would be the Latin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is okay. it like sal salutation or uh, in Spanish today, salud? It all comes from that comes from that root. Oh, OK. Well, hail. And uh, one reason why I wanted to uh, talk with you um, and then share the talk with others is that because you have very uh, unusual approach to spirituality, like uh, most people who are spiritual, they're either going to be some sort of Christian in the West, especially, or else they're going to adopt some sort of Eastern um, spiritual tradition like Buddhism or Hinduism or some such. And uh, you have taken a, a different path from either of those. And uh, it's my understanding you are primarily a Neoplatonist. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, Neoplatonism is the, definitely the philosophical framework, I think, brings together kind of every the uh, sort of eclectic bunch of things I've studied and sort of fallen into. Uh, I consider it really to be the Western tradition. And it's really it shaped it, it had an immense effect on Christianity as it developed like a coherent semi-coherent theology. Uh, it was really the current uh, that really kind of shaped the Western way of thinking as the Roman Empire collapsed and we went into the Middle Ages, though the Christian church would always deny the Platonic influence on the religion. They have to, that kind of religion has to assert its own, you know, uniqueness, like we're, we're special. Like yeah. our, our doctrine comes, it just comes straight from, you know, from uh, Jesus or something. Yeah, then again, on the other hand, in the beginning was the Logos. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't ask them to explain that, that part. Don't go into like Pastor Bob's church on the side of the road. Be like, hey, can you explain? Can you can you tell me where this logos comes from? Yeah, they're probably they're just gonna go. No, it's called the Word. As in, uh, in the beginning of the universe, the King James Bible just like popped into into existence. Yeah, but I mean, like in. Uh, to the Greeks, logos, I mean, they really had this idea that an aspect of a thing's reality was its name. So it was like logos was also sort of like a creative force that renders that, you know, a, um, like causes things to be real. Right. Yeah, that's that's right. When you get into the when you get deep into the nitty gritty philosophy, like really the whole platonic tradition. Yeah, the logos is sort of the manifestation of, you know, a divine energy or divine absolute. So it's a part of the creation of the reality that we that we do live in. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I know relatively little about Neoplatonism. I tried reading Plotinus's Aeneads once and didn't get very far because I had too short of an attention span at the time. I was like in my twenties at the time, and uh, but it's it's always been interesting to me, and um, uh, I really do like if there is such a thing as rebirth. I assume I was a Roman. In a in a past life, you know, and possibly like a, a like a Greek who was Romanized, living like around Naples, you know, like in Italy, because Italy was like you know Great Greece, you know, mega, oh, yeah. you know. So um, I really do have a, a great interest in that, and I really consider one of the greatest tragedies to befall Western civilization was um, not merely the advent of Christianity, but the like the hyster hysterical intolerance of Christianity that just absolutely would not allow any kind of rivals and just wiped out all indigenous uh, Western religious systems. Um, pretty much. I mean, anything that still exists is vestigial. 
That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it just seems like a great tragedy to me that uh, the indigenous European spiritual systems were pretty much just exterminated and replaced by um, essentially uh, like a, a Semitic system that, that did get westernized to some degree. So, I mean, you can say that, you know, like Christianity or Roman Catholicism could be, you know, arguably called like a legitimate Western spiritual tradition, you know, a, a legitimate That's European. Right, yeah. But but still, I mean, it would be nice if uh, we still had some of the really ancient stuff that uh, you know our, our ancient ancestors um, followed or, or believed. Sort of like you know the the Hindus of India. You know, they've still got the Vedic tradition going way back to like 1500 BC at at the latest, and uh, they've just modified it. It's instead of their the tradition of polytheistic paganism or whatever just becoming stale and people not believing it anymore and then just getting abandoned for something else they uh you know they just it just evolved with them you know they, they were somehow able to just keep it evolving so that it never really got outgrown yeah well well luckily we have uh from this particular tradition there's just a ton of surviving material we could say that the the Enneads plus the like the Corpus Hermeticum and the Platonic dialogues together, you could almost say that's like our version of like the Upanishads. It's it's really the like same kind of content in there. You know, we don't we don't necessarily have the Vedas that we can the, the sacred poetry of the West that goes back like fifty thousand years. I'm I'm trying to have the, I know the Hindu time scales they tend to they tend to use numbers in a very poetic rather than yeah, empirical in an way. astronomical but, sense. Yeah, like. Uh, 50, I know even some forms of Buddhism, like 500,000 mantra, what's the term, like kalpas and yeah, these time kalpa terms. Like a, like a world system. So that'd be like yeah. one earth. But in a way, Buddhism is almost like Nietzsche with the recurring, you know, the, the per, eternal recurrence, where it's just right. after one world passes away, a new world arises, which also has like the, you know, the, the Vedic kind of culture in a, in like a Ganges Valley of India, you know, so it's like this perennial theme. Yeah. Perennial. Yeah. So anyway, we have, we have the text. The problem is, is like this sort of a, I guess a perception problem on tracing its lineage. So uh, the platonic tradition did stay alive, but it had to cloak itself uh, within, within Christianity. You have some Christian mystics in the middle ages that were Platonists, but they had to like, they had to, uh, basically just kiss the ring of the church and, and and bend their ideas to fit with the dogmas. So we have that lineage survival, kind of, sort of. The real, the the esoteric lineage from the from classical Platonism really actually survives through the Middle East, through Islam and Judaism. While Christianity was really intolerant, when Islam rose, it was actually Islam was the more tolerant tradition for like the, maybe the first 300, 400 years. And then after that, it became way more intolerant than, you know, was trying to outdo Christianity as far as just how, you know, just repressive and anti-intellectual and really anti-spiritual in many ways it was. So we have uh, in the Middle Ages, when the, by the time the Renaissance happened, we had all this uh, sort of preserved uh, platonic esotericism coming back into Europe, first through Greeks when the, when the Ottomans invaded and basically the Byzantine Empire shrunk down to the size of a pea. I think it was just like Constantinople and some districts. Yeah, but, yeah, just a few, a few places in Greece and uh, a few yeah, places yeah, yeah. along the northern shores of uh, Anatolia were still not right. Byzantines. So then we had this weird kind of anomaly in in uh, Muslim ruled Spain was actually a very open, tolerant place. And that was like the favorite place for Jews at the time. So they were allowed to basically do whatever they want. And they were, you know, they were really engaged in a lot of scholarship and intellect. And actually, a lot of the, the, the Kabbalah was actually formed in uh, medieval Spain, where these kind of esoterics were able to, you know, they, they, they were able to sort of do whatever they want and pursue, you know, within, within the bounds of making it seem Hebrew enough. So then these traditions went eventually went up in, into Europe. So first through like uh, like Florence, you had the de' Medici family. They were huge sponsors of bringing Hermeticism back into Europe. And then later in the Middle Ages, in Germany especially, there was a lot of esotericism that came in with uh, kind of snuck under the Protestant Reformation. So you had this tradition called the Rosicrucians that were, you know, in, in places that were parts of Germany that were ruled by Protestant princes that was able to kind of sort of stay under the radar. Yeah, I remember the Rosicrucians used to advertise in the back pages of magazines. 
Yeah, that's that's right. There are these American Rosicrucian organizations who are claiming the Rosicrucian lineage. So you get some guys, some, of course, being an American thing, there was a big monetary component to these organizations. So you get some guy claiming to be initiated by some master over in Europe. And so you had like, a, there was like three or four different American Rosicrucian societies that they all like bitterly hated one another. And they put half their energy into just putting out just like smear propaganda against okay. like, against against the other guy. So that's, that's a whole other, <laughs> that would be a whole other topic. But I guess the main point is like the, the esotericism from, western the western classical greatness it had to be literally occulted under you know under these abrahamic religions so that i think the teaching lineages are there it's just now we you know people like me we could be like openly pagan oriented without fear of being burned at the stake or, or like driven out of society you know there's yeah. now there's other things that get us driven out of you know polite society but yeah, at least i can you know i can worship the the greco-roman gods and people are just like whatever yeah yeah that's interesting to me and I, I would like to kind of uh go over just a little bit of the history of like like western spirituality like you started off with um you know this um, let's just start it just uh, for the sake of convenience with uh like the indo-european you know like the the fire cult with the sacrifices and it was right. very little philosophy involved and it was mainly just worldly sacrifices to the gods to get them on your side so that uh, you would have sons and cattle and victory in battle and that sort of thing. And then right. I assume some of the first really spiritual movements in, in the West would be like Pythagoreanism or something like that, where you've got um, this sort of skeptical philosophers that were, you know, free thinking and intelligent enough that they would start start developing their own system or at least a kind of radical reformation. And uh, so it's something like Pythagoreanism or something like that, I assume, would be like the the roots yeah. of of some kind of European spirituality that isn't just shamanism. That's that's and, right. And then like yeah. the cults also. That's right. It, yeah, and the traditions I work with, we kind of we we consider Pythagoras to be like kind of the ultimate founder. He brought in spirituality from the East into Greece, and in my opinion, it was, Greece was like a total spiritual backwater prior to these mystery traditions popping up in that era, you know, starting in the 500s, 400s, that's when really things got heated up. And same thing with the philosophy too, obviously, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. So yeah, Pythagoras really, he studied, uh, the tradition says he studied about 20 years in the temples of Egypt, where a lot of the, a lot of that sort of occultism, esotericism was just kind of locked up there for centuries. So he wow. studied with the priests, and I think 20 years into his study, the Persians conquered Egypt. And then the Persians thought, uh, Pythagoras would be somebody valuable to take back to back to East with them. So he ended up in Babylon, like studying with the Persian Magi and other like mystics and astrologers and people like that. So really he brings these like, so he brings like the esoteric traditions of Mesopotamia and Egypt and fuses it together and brings it into Greece. And all of a sudden after him and Heraclitus was kind of the other founder of philosophy along with some of the other pre Socratic, suddenly you just see wisdom flowering in in the you know in the hellenistic world after yeah. that so where did pythagoras get his idea of reincarnation that's a good question it had to be so, some of um, these esoteric masters he was studying from it's uh really it's just a matter of speculation nobody can really know for sure so it could have been from each reincarnation was never a public teaching in egypt they it was always just focused on like kind of one afterlife state yeah, yeah, they, yeah so you had to be properly embalmed too because that was the only body you get yeah they, they were obsessed with um it seems like the egyptian religion was obsessed with like prolonging the immediate afterlife state after like you know dying from your life you were living uh, especially with like uh high ranking and like kings and in, in, in nobility especially they're obsessed with the embalming and so in the the, the occult traditions i work from the seems to be, it seems to imply that uh the kings were doing this to try to avoid their karma so they can exist in this kind of weird limbo state without having to you know after that state would expire they might be born as a nobody somewhere and you know suffer from all the you know probably not so nice things they might have done in, in, in that particular lifetime oh i see so it's like the the weighing of the car or something like that and they're trying right. to own that 
Yeah, and the Book of the Dead has a lot of details on on the various things that get weighed when you're finally judged. And it's funny, it, the part on all the criteria, actually, some of those word by word make it into the Ten Commandments we find in, in the Hebrew Bible. Oh, so correct. that might have actually been the source. Whoever was compiling the Torah just, you know, went through a bunch of texts from older traditions and just said, oh, these these sound like they might make a good uh, a bunch of good rules for for this religion. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So we had we just start off with just essentially crude animism and just uh, kind of worldly polytheism. And then you start having inspired philosophers. And, and just I, I might as well toss in that like a, a good Buddhist might say that uh, Pythagoras just had the wisdom that he finally was able to penetrate to the the reality of reincarnation independently, you know, just yeah. through an insight or whatever. But then uh, then you start having mystery cults. I don't know when like the earliest mystery cult started up. But um, there is a I've read a really interesting book called Battle for the Mind that talks about how it's just a universal phenomenon, not not only among humans, but even among other mammals, including dogs, where you just get locked into a habitual attitude and it takes like a state of crisis to break loose from that. And that's how like like military basic training works where you just break them down and then rebuild them as unquestioning fighting machines. And a lot of religious systems do this. And even like under Stalin, the, the interrogation methods would not only get you to confess to trying to overthrow the government, but even to believe that you were trying to overthrow the government, that kind of a thing. Yeah. And so um, like a lot of manhood rituals in, in prim more primitive quote unquote societies are like this. So like the mystery cults, it seems to me uh, one of the main purposes of those was just to just inspire such awe and dread into somebody's heart that it was like caused this state of crisis where they were able to be reborn in some way and then like like adopt like preferably hopefully a wiser kind of attitude afterwards. Right. I think that's yeah, I think that's dead on. I think that was kind of the main purpose behind the specific rituals that these these cults adopted. So it's like you take a normie, you know, and how do, how do you shake a normie out of just a, um, all just a web of mental formations that just make their normie consciousness? You have to do something pretty drastic to yeah. do it. Yeah. So some of these cults, I think, use hallucinogens. Others would like put people through ordeals, especially the Mithraic cult was very was very masculine, very kind of militaristic oriented. So they would they would like put the candidates like initiates through like all sorts of ordeals and humiliations to sort of shift the consciousness so they could advance to like a higher grade. And, you know, the grades sort of follow the advancement of, of consciousness up away from the just worldly normie level up to, you know, something something more advanced and, and much more wise. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they use ordeals and hallucinogens and, and who knows what else where, you know, it's like um, I've read where, you know, first you'd have to go through the purification process. So they, you, you're living with the priests, you know, you got these solemn white robe priests and everything's quiet and maybe you're fasting or you're just eating a very simple diet for a few days to get yourself purified and everything's very solemn. And, you know, you get into this solemn state and then they they give you the, the hellebore or whatever it is. And then they put you in the cave and then they've yeah. got you know, like these apparitions appearing, you know, like priests wearing masks and just scaring the be living bejesus out of you until you just have some sort of um, uh, just, I don't know what the, what the word would be, just ab reaction or something where you just, you just have this kind of breakthrough, just uh, possibly just out of being scared half out of your wits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah, there's uh, different, different, many different ways to, uh, skin the cat known as plato's cave i suppose yeah so how does hermeticism fit in with all this this is something i know almost nothing about it's uh like started off like egyptian or something yeah well that's that's the claim of the tradition it claims to go back deep into like the uh like the first the, the Earl old kingdom of egypt but the the textual tradition we have is can be probably reliably traced to middle platonism which was around say maybe the 200s uh, CE. Uh, so just by literary analysis, there was a huge, and especially in Alexandria and Egypt, there was this huge syncretistic scene there that Middle Platonism is actually what evolved into Neoplatonism. But before that, you had uh, a lot of the Gnosticisms came out of, out of Middle Platonism. 
Uh, a lot of early Christian theology came directly out of Middle Platonism. You had um, or, uh, Origen and Clement were some of the actual first uh, Christian the uh, inventors of Christian theology, really. Because I, I don't think he even had like a unified theology or anything like that prior to them. So they were actually students of Platonist masters. Like, you know, you're not going to get like Catholic priests or Protestant ministers really talking about this. But so they studied under like pagan philosophers and then they brought that philosophy into into their church. Yeah, I think I remember reading that uh, Plotinus and Clement shared the same teacher. Yeah, he was uh, one of the great sages of our tradition. His name, Ammonius Saccus, was his name, and he was he was the great teacher of Plotinus. He was like kind of the image that you think of like a really wise yogi. So you get picture that in like Alexandria, uh, circa like the early two hundreds, maybe. And he he wrote nothing down himself. It was all oral teachings. But so Plotinus was the one who wrote everything. He wrote down all the teachings of Ammonius Saccus. So that's how we, the, the Enneads is really kind of a, um, it's a written record of, of all the teachings that came out of his his tradition. So yeah, we have, we have, we have Christian theologians from that same, kind of that same root right there. Yeah. Onius Sackis, he was influenced by Indian philosophy, or at least he wanted to go to India and it just didn't pan out or something like that? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, that that's, I've seen that theory floated around. He could have been, I mean, he didn't, those days, if you're in Alexandria, it was such a cosmopolitan city. You didn't even have to go to India because there were probably people from India, like just, you know, visiting the city or like living there yeah. for a little while. Yeah, I consider. I mean, there could even have been like like nowadays you've got like uh, um, like Burmese monasteries in the USA. I mean, if wherever you've got lots of immigrants, you're going to be importing some of the religion. So there could have been like little Buddhist monasteries or temples around Alexandria or or elsewhere. In oh, the yeah. The Roman Empire. Oh, yeah, that that's certainly plausible. I, there, there, there were the attestations of see the the Greeks called any Indian ascetic. They called them all gymno gymnosophists. That was yeah. a term they just kind of. <laughs> there were probably a bunch of different traditions actually practiced that fell under that umbrella, but they, they just called them. That. But anyways, I think in Alexandria they were the, the presence of the, them were attested. So I think he certainly had that coming in. And of course, that was uh, that was a big effect on Gnosticism too. Gnosticism took on such an anti-worldly uh, ideology. You know, the, they were really hard at the, on the material world, just being evil and corrupt. And I, I think really those ideas must have come from the East. Yeah. And they kind of they sort of took it in a little bit of a melodramatic direction, I think. But I think the source of that is kind of kind of self-evident. Yeah, yeah. It's like I was just mentioning earlier how it was kind of a a tragedy that indigenous European spirituality pretty much got wiped out. But um, what we're talking about now, like a lot of this mystical stuff, it's, you know, it's coming from like Egypt and Syria and that sort of thing where, I mean, even that is not purely indigenous European spirituality. Yeah, none of it. You know, a lot of uh, Platonism came, a lot of uh, the great masters and mystics in the Platonic tradition were like Hellenized Syrians and like Hellenized Egyptians. Yeah. So there, there was a, there was like a big like Levantine influence on the whole development of that. Yeah. So it was like the Orientalization of of like Roman religion. There's a lot of talk right. about that, like in the early Empire, where it's just uh, it was just all the all the rage to worship Isis or worship Cybele or belong to yeah. some of these um, Eastern mystery cults and that sort of thing. That's that's right. Yeah, that that kind of filled the spiritual vent. as as the sort of uh, Hellenistic culture was in its collapse phase, which we could say would be in the first several centuries of the Roman Empire. Really, that Oriental Oriental spirituality really just filled in the filled in the vacuum. Yeah, it's kind of too bad. Although I'm I'm just interested to uh, to know if there was any Indian influence on some of this. Yeah, I mean, I think there had to be. I think there certainly did have to be. We have the tradition to one of the one of the great sages. He was actually um, he was a celebrity at the time. His name was Apollonius of Tyana. Oh yeah. And we see it speculated actually the character of the Jesus of the Gospels might have been partly influenced by him because he was like a celebrity mystic and sage who traveled all around the Eastern Mediterranean and supposedly you know performed miracles and like healed the sick and did all this this kind of stuff. But it, it's in the tradition of him that he made not one, but two journeys to India. Oh, good. 
Yeah, so his his actual school, he was considered a Neo-Pythagorean, so he practiced the Pythagorean lineage and uh, undoubtedly infused a lot of Eastern ideas into that. And of course, he had a lot of students, so probably some of the Middle Platonists and Neo-Platonists, you know, some of their teachings were, you know, inherited from him, I, I could imagine. Yeah, yeah, I read his uh, biography. I can't remember who wrote it, but um, uh, I've also read that uh, the pagans were trying to hold him up as sort of a, a rival to 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 Christ for for right. like sort of a pagan Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that too. Yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know. I still kind of believe he might have been the prototype of the, the at least the character in the drama that we know is the Gospels now. Which I don't. I don't think that was the original story about about Jesus. I just think the religion morphed. I think it morphed over time, and there were like a lot of different Christianities. There was no one Christianity before, like uh, Constantine and the the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think probably the general details of the Gospel according to Mark are probably not too far off. You know, it's just right. And then and then all kinds of stuff gets added to that. Yeah, I've seen scholars say that um, both Luke and Matthew have source dependence on Mark, so they were yeah. kind of just expansions of Mark. Yeah, plus like there's another stuff. another manuscript called Q that they also both rely on, just because right. they're in agreement on certain things that aren't found in Mark. Yeah, hmm. and then and then yeah. I've uh, read also that John, which is just radically different from the the other three. He was uh, just putting words into Jesus's mouth to refute certain Gnostic sects that were becoming fashionable at the time. Yeah, well, I, I, I actually on one of my discords, so we, we have some not Gnostics on there. People call themselves that. So there's a lot of a lot of theories I've indulged in on the, like the theory of John, and there's 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 a lot of speculation that like John was originally a Gnostic gospel, and then the church later. Uh, after Constantine, his, his main scribe, this guy named Eusebius of Caesarea, he was like the, the main spin doctor who took older texts and just rewrote them to like suit the new, the new you know, the new Trinitarian theology that was favored by the church after, yeah. after Nicaea. So he might have taken, John might have been like more like Gnostic or like dualistic before that. It might have just been kind of sanitized to sort of the format that we have today. So was Gnosticism more Christian or pagan? Or was it more Judeo-Christian or pagan? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, Gnosticism isn't very pagan friendly. It like it considers a lot of the pagan gods to be archons, just like just like you know the, the Jewish god to Yahweh. Uh -huh. uh, I actually I think Gnosticism. I've seen other people speculate this too. It was originally the first Gnostic sects were just like disaffected Jews who apostated from their the religion of birth. And they were living in cosmopolitan Alexandria, so they just started syncretizing all this like other mystical stuff into it. And then, of course, the first thing they did is they rebelled against the god of their upbringing, and you know, cast him off as the, you know, Yahweh is the devil. He's the he, he's the one. Yeah, he's the creator, but he's not a not a good creator. You know, he created all the misery and horrible horrible suffering that humans are humans are subject to in these miserable little lives. Yeah, yeah, I just wrote recently about how, in a lot of ways, Yahweh comes closer to the Buddhist Mara than than uh, yeah. than, than than Satan does, because yeah. you know, it's like the god of samsara, essentially. Yeah, I th this would fit well with kind of how the Gnostics framed him, you know. I mean, it's not hard. You just need to take a literal reading of the uh, of the Old Testament, and you know, it's pretty clear he's not a very nice guy. Yeah, definitely, and then. It was like even around the time of the Babylonian captivity when they they composed the Book of Job, and the Book of Job is really it's it's really a hard hitting you know really a yes like a visceral effect if if you read it, and then at the end after Job is just literally just gone through the ringer. I mean he's just he's yeah. just been messed up in every possible way. Then God essentially says, "Well, I'm bigger, stronger, and smarter than you are, and I can hurt you if I want to." That's essentially that's essentially <laughs> the answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, luckily, in pagan religions, you might get some gods like that, but there's other gods you can go to, like appeal to as like a counter force to that. You know, yeah. you have like Zeus could be a real asshole sometimes, but then Hera comes along and like gets back at him, and you know sort of like puts him in his place temporarily until he's off doing yeah. 
Be- and you, you might know this better than I do, but um, like in the early Hinduism, like Vedic, Vedic times already, they had this idea that even the gods are subject to a kind of divine order. There is like a kind of universal law that even the gods have to obey. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, was there anything like that in like the classical polytheism? See, prior to philosophy, it's hard, like, the, everything was so local. Every city-state had its, like, own different version of how to interpret the myths or even different myths. So there was no, like, consolidated theology or, like, uh, you know, philosophical explanation of them all. But in later, the later Platonic traditions, that's where this kind of element comes in, where they try to make sense of these traditions. So in Neoplatonism, you end up, by the time of uh, Iamblichus, he's... He's in, we're right now in the 300s here. Uh, actually, yeah, look, it's maybe the late 200s. I forget the exact date. But you start to get, they, they start reclassifying the gods. So you get these categories of the hypercosmic and incosmic gods. So the hypercosmic are like beyond causality. And then the incosmic gods are kind of within the bounds of the natural order and like the laws of nature. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've often considered, you know, how classical paganism could have been saved you know like if if julian the apostate had stayed alive you know how how it could have been saved and i i have considered just the idea that uh i mean zeus himself would be a, a tricky one because you know he's already this personified guy essentially you know but also to the like the neoplatonists i assume he would be like uh like practically a synonym for the good or you know the highest the highest principle you know i think some philosophers did refer to just the, the absolute as zeus yeah it got to that point where uh in in some of the neoplatonism he was part of kind of this demiurge triad so he was like paired with like helios and sometimes dionysus or sometimes like uh hades they were kind of like this, this sort of like triple god, almost like what the Egyptians were doing when they were combining their like main gods into kind of like a big sort of mega god. So that yeah. that's the tradition. The tradition Julian worked with, it was very much Yamblichan uh, Neoplatonism and sort of Heli- Helios, the, you know, the, the, the sun god was sort of the head of, of this like creator triad and like Zeus was like an aspect of it. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate. I don't think that would have survived modern science. With with Helios being one of the, uh, you know, one an aspect of the absolute, since he's yeah. I mean, the sun is just like a relatively small star now. Yeah, but, well, like in the earlier the earlier stuff, he was like literally the sun, and then in the in the Neoplatonism, he's kind of like the idea behind the sun, like the son of suns, sort of sort yeah. of thing, sort of the form of you know of suns or a sun. Yeah, yeah, I was considering like just thinking about how it could have been done, you know, where you would have the highest God, but then you'd have some of the the lesser gods, because it is polytheism after all, where, um, you know, each one would be sort of like, they could serve as kind of a window or an intermediary to the highest God, you know, like, um, like Aphrodite, like in uh, Plato's Symposium, he talks about how there are two Aphrodites, you know, there's the human one and the cosmic one, you know? Right, and, right. Uh, so it'd be like, you know, you could you could worship the cosmic Aphrodite and the aspect of the absolute of just you know infinite love or something like that, infinite beauty. Or like, uh, if you're drawn to Apollo, then you could you could worship the absolute in in like the Apollonian aspect of just like stability and 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 just just perfect uh, like balance and poise that kind of a thing. Or like Dionysius, I mean, he would just be sort of like the uh, uh, just the the chaotic aspect and you know the energetic aspect, you know that sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Each of these, in the more philosophical traditions, each of these got they they have like a higher essence. Yeah. Sort of like the building block of reality, and then the way you know when you mix them into the lower levels, when you get down to like the uh, when the more like psychic and then spiritual levels, they get intermingled with other energies. So that's where the less, you know, the less pure manifestations of the, of these gods come in. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I mean, Buddhism, of course, is just sort of almost marginalized uh, the gods. You know, they, they exist. It's almost like an Epicureanism where, you know, gods right. exist, but they just mind their own business. They don't really give a damn about us any more than we give a damn about ants in a vacant lot, you know, next door. Right. 
Yeah, they uh, in Buddhism the devas they're kind of just like superhuman sort of beings that live a lot longer. And they have like more like uh, psychic powers and some more wisdom than humans. Is that kind of how it is? In, um, in even Buddhism? in regard to the wisdom aspect, you don't see very much of it. And it, I think it's um, I've I've written about this before, where it's the same lack of imagination that mucks up mainstream science fiction where you've got space aliens that are essentially just humans in weird looking bodies you know or or and it's the same lack of imagination that it caused <laughs> polytheists to imagine the gods as essentially just you know more powerful more long-lived humans yeah, this is actually what neo neo pagans do. They imagine the gods to be these like Marvel comic superheroes. Or even like worse, like Pikachu's, you know, they kind of just really trivialize them and, and they can't, the neo-paganism is really just like, it's it's a facet of pop culture. There's really nothing philosophical about it. And it's, they was, use the term LARP is, a, is yeah. a good way of summing up kind of what people who call themselves neo-pagans actually, actually do. But yeah, that's, I guess, kind of a similar thing with imagining, you know, imagining the gods. Yeah, which is it is unfortunate, but it's unavoidable because you can't really imagine anything beyond your own experience. Right. You, know, I mean, you right. can sort of add sort of like the the Egyptians. You know, they're just sticking animal heads onto people and calling those gods. You know, just they're trying to get them different somehow or another. But they really yeah. don't have a kind of imagination that will transcend their own limitations. Yeah, and I think we get into the problem here too is what happens with any religion or spirituality on on the the nor the normie commoner level like the average person just doesn't doesn't really have much uh much wisdom or philosophical depth to the way they imagine or conceptualize these things so you just get a lot of just dumbed down religion in general whether it's pagan or monotheistic or abrahamic or you know a dharmic religion you know you i don't i know in, in buddhism you get a lot of kind of folk where it's a, like sort of syncretized with folk traditions in like various Asian countries, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, also like ancient Indian tradition and like like Burma, for example, which is devoutly Buddhist, the, um, the classical culture that their civilization relies upon, like ours relies upon Rome, is is ancient India. And so it's it just fits the it fits the way they think better. You know, they can accept the whole idea of of the devas and you know the the Buddha with all the the miraculous powers and and all this sort of thing. You know, twenty seven feet tall and all the rest. And um, you know they don't they don't have any difficulty with that. But I mean, in the modern West, it's just a really a huge dilemma because any kind of spiritual system has to have some sort of narrative that that the average person can grasp and and accept. And yeah, we're just we're just it seems like we're floundering now because we've outgrown. Uh, the old myths, and there's really been nothing thus far that replaces it other than just spiritually bankrupt scientific materialism. Yeah, scientific materialism and just uh, lots of pop culture narratives, lots of inner, lots of mindless mass entertainment. That's really kind of the de facto, I think, mythology of the day. It's just the science, science, you know, scientific materialism plus uh, stupid entertainment products. Yeah, and scientific materialism can be called a religious system. I mean, it's definitely based on articles of faith. Yeah, you know, there are plenty of axioms that are not self-evident that that you just that scientists just accept as a matter of faith without realizing it. You know, like the um, like like there is a physical universe that exists even when nobody's looking. That kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those questions they don't get asked really, and it it, it, it kind of shows. Um, dispels one of the big myths of our time that we're, we modern Western people, we have science now. We're more enlightened than these barbarians from the past who didn't know anything. They barely knew how to treat a wound probably, you know. We have all this just amazing technology. Nobody who's a proponent of this worldview ever asks like, are we actually really wiser than these people from, from the past? And the next question would be why, you know. You start, to, you start writing things down and like questioning these things out and then I think Anyone who would like seriously entertains these questions might suddenly hit a roadblock and, and rethink their sort of assumptions on, you know, on the world. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, 
you were saying earlier that uh, like Europe was a kind of spiritual or philosophical backwater. And I think to some degree, we always have been. I, I don't know if it's genetic or just cultural, but the Western mind is so extroverted. We want to understand reality by looking outwards instead of inwards. And so yeah. in a way, we're like spiritual retards. And I mean, that has made us really powerful. I mean, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And we've just specialized in mammon and we've got scientific technology and all that. And it's very powerful and it works, at least at a superficial outward level. But um, yeah, it doesn't really make us any happier. And I do think that contentment and just equanimity is like the, it's like the touchstone for, for judging how wise a person is. And I mean, we're just largely infantile in that regard, especially. Oh, so like, yeah, completely. Yeah, I, I guess you could say Mammon is the patron deity of of America. Yeah, or or just in the sense of materialism, just of the entire Western civilization. I mean, yeah. Europe, Europe's even more materialistic than Americans are. Europe, there are more atheists in Europe than there are in America. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I do wonder if this does like go back even like tens of thousands of years to just like. Western Eurasian people, as an example, just being more, uh, n having more of a natural temperament that trends towards like worldly action and materialism versus yeah, like, just like objectivity and like being extroverted. So this raises the question: so if the uh, proto Hindus came from the steppes of Eurasia, now we're getting into territory where we might offend some Hindus. Uh, we took some pot shots at Christians already, so I think it's fair yeah. game. But so. Uh, were the original Hindus of this more Western Eurasian stock that was more worldly oriented, and then they uh, must have absorbed a pre-existing spiritual system into the lands in South Asia where they migrated into. I think I've seen you speculate on how the a lot of the asceticism, mysticism may have in fact come from the Indus Valley civilization that, yeah, that pre-existed. Yeah. 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 So, so Originally, Vedism wasn't so different from the the polytheism of the ancient Greeks, where it was the same. You know, you had the priests doing the fire sacrifices for the kings. Um, partly, it's like uh, like the Pax Deorum, where it's just sort of a like a national cult kind of a thing, where you're doing the the sacrifices just to keep the gods on the side of your people, so that you'll continue to prosper and and have many right. sons and and defeat your enemies and all that. But um, the Indus Valley civilization, um, uh, they, they had, uh, it's pretty obvious they had like a, an established religious tradition there that was very different from elsewhere because it tended to be like atheistic for starters. You know, they just believed in um, like forces and, and like karma. They had different interpretations of what karma actually is, but they had this idea that the earth is a bad place that it's a place of suffering and that your goal is to escape from this world through purifying your karma. And the Jains have more of a sort of a materialistic approach to that, like the, the Sankhya philosophy, which is what yoga is based on now. It also had that kind of atheistic, uh, just purify your, your soul so that you can escape from the world. And uh, Buddhism obviously has uh, definitely uh, a, a firm basis in that. Although um, there had been a lot of mixing by the time the Buddha came along, like a, about a thousand years of mixing between the two traditions. Yeah. So I, I don't know, it almost seems like the natural spirituality of South Asia just reasserted itself after the, the Aryan invasions. Uh, it's possible, although there, there could have been a kind of hybrid vigor where, um, like the Indus Valley civilization, it was very mechanical. I mean, it, in... I assume there must have been like really inspired, you know, spiritual beings, but uh, just looking at how it works, you know, how oh, yeah. philosophy works, you know, it's very just mechanical, mechanistic. You you have to just uh, exhaust your karma largely through self torture, that kind of a thing. And uh, yeah. it, they really tried hard. I mean, it was very inspiring to them, but but still, uh, there wasn't much concept of like really higher philosophy to it. Yeah, mechanistic too. Even in the material culture, in the you look at the urban planning of of the cities of the Indus Valley, like it, very uniform. Everything was like a strict grid layout. The cities pretty much looked the same the way they were designed. Like they were designed from some like blueprints, uh, and they had like a, like a pretty advanced uh, hydro like uh, hydrological 
works in 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 these places too it just looks like if they had their material things pretty pretty laid out and figured out yeah so um yeah i think uh the the spirituality of india was relies largely on the pre-existing spiritual tradition before the the indo-aryans invaded although the indo-aryans added a lot of uh imagination and um like vitality to it i think oh yeah yeah, I mean, the, their myths are still the foundation of pretty much all the all of Hinduism and the traditions that branched off from there. Yeah. So, but I mean, when the Indo-Europeans migrated, they, they did bring vitality. You could say they brought vitality everywhere. So I think it's a, another narrative that sort of um, gives the other side of the story to the people who invaded the, the Indian subcontinent is the the, uh, if you go into the scriptures of Zoroastrianism, you get the sort of the counter movement. So when the Aryans were kind of moving through Central Asia and, and farther south, so you get this uh, this Zarathustra figure. Now, there's so many disagreements over when he actually existed. There's no real, yeah. but there's definitely a myth or a story in there about like a rebel. You could say like a rebellious Rishi who revolts against like the main like proto brahmanical religion, and so his accusation is that the priests were just helping these horse raiders just like basically bully agricultural sediment settlements and collect tribute from them so the priests would like they would say yeah the gods favor our, our raids and you know then they, they, they do all this like kind of pageantry that, that that zarathustra thought was just superfluous and just spiritually you know meaningless and, and, and vacuous so he's like i'm going to start my own cult that's just like pure it's it's devoted to just the pure development of, of of the mental and spiritual faculty. We don't need all this get all this ritualism out of the way. You know, his, his sect was very iconoclastic. So we get we get the start of that whole thing, and many have speculated that that this was one of the influences of like way later on 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 Abrahamism, after the Persian Empire. You know, had this massive state that spanned from Greece all the way to like India and then like Central Asia and yeah. the north. Yeah, and I, I, we were discussing earlier how uh, that could be why Zarathustra uh, had his his god of light be uh, Ahura Mazda, which is uh, an Asura or a Titan rather than the Devas that everybody else considered to be the winner of the primordial war. Right, right. I see. I, there's sort of an unofficial consensus that he took the uh, the the pro like Paleo Vedic god Varuna and just rebranded him as Ahura Mazda. And actually, the Zoroastrians, they took a lot of old Vedic deities and just kind of put new names on them. And then they came up with this term called the Yazata, which is basically it's like an angelic servant of the one, you know, the one main high god. Uh -huh. So then the whole angel angelic model we see later in Judaism and then Christianity and Islam probably took influence from that, you know, original innovation. Yeah, and they, almost certainly they got the idea of, of Satan from Ahriman. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The idea of there being one like main anti-god, one one main source of evil. So, and that created what I call radical dualism, where you get these, the, you know, it's unlike monistic religions where you have this one principle of ultimate reality. Now you have this like eternally existing opposing principles. To me, it philosophically just doesn't work out for it doesn't. I, I, I can't work it out. Phil. It, yeah, it yeah, seems just incoherent to me. Samsaric to me. I mean, you're just stuck in some yeah. sort of case like that. Yeah, it's very, it's very samsaric. So the Zoroastrian religion just became very worldly and ritualistic and obsessed with this dualism. It got it, it filtered down into all these superstitions. Like certain species of animals were considered to be a creation of the evil god of Ariman, and it was like very arbitrary which animals were considered this. So you, you had these jokes about ancient Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrians going out and like mass murdering tortoises because they thought tortoises were a creation of Ariman. Oh, that's too bad for the tortoises. Yeah, 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 too bad. Yeah, weird, weird kind of fanaticism, you know. Yeah, but, uh, that's just as so long as we're we're humans, I think we're pretty much stuck with uh, a certain amount of irrationality and foolishness. That's right. Yeah, and I think any popular religion is going to have some some variety of that you know one way shape or form yeah yeah any any kind of popular religion is going to consist mostly of fools because the average normie is going to be you know making up most of the religious followers 
And uh, the average normie, I mean, he might be kind of a, a good enough sort of guy, but uh, still going with uh, the possibilities of the human spirit, you know, he's still pretty crude. Yeah. And then they, they yeah. often, if it becomes like a, uh, like a mainstream religion, it's they're the ones that are the politicians that get put into the high priest positions. Yeah, that's right. Like, uh, yeah, like in the Catholic Church, they were, the priests were politicians, I think, from the get-go. Although you can say that of the, the the main state pagan Roman religion, it was that was kind of true too. All the priests were just people from like really high ranking aristocratic families. They were just kind of put into that role. Yeah, yeah. Even Julius Caesar was a priest of uh, Jupiter. I yeah. think. Yeah, I think any high consul was considered a priest. So, and then you had even in Greece, you had the same thing. A lot of uh, a lot of the priests were just chief magistrates of their whatever city state they came from. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I have a little pet theory on this because I think all the original Indo-European cultures had like priestly castes, but in the Mediterranean, it might have been after the Bronze Age, Bronze Age collapse, there was just so much social collapse that maybe some of these systems just failed. And then the sort of the religion just built itself up from the ground after the sort of the Dark Ages carried on. And it, they didn't really, they had made to have broken priestly lineages. So it's just like the like the warrior class the warrior aristocrats just sort of appointed themselves priests and represented the religion in some of these places. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it can work sometimes. I suppose the uh, the Buddha himself was a member of the warrior caste. Yeah, I guess you see that as a theme in the Iron Age, is sort of the warrior the warrior caste sort of taking over religion. It's yeah, like, just the, the culture places. heroes in general were, the, were like the men of action, the, the warrior caste. Yeah, in Rome, there's kind of some subtle hints that the actual priestly caste was among the Etruscan people. There's a lot of Roman authors who acknowledge that a lot of like uh, like divination systems and like occult lore come from the Etruscan priests. And oh yeah, and that's where you get like with them. augers and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I guess the problem then is in you know as Rome got bigger and bigger, it started swallowing up more of Italy. The Etruscans became they became sandwiched between the Romans and the Gauls, and then. Eturia basically just disappeared at some point. It was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So then you had these Roman priests sort of trying to, you know, maybe do their best to carry on the the old pure pure religion. So before we finish this, I'd like to um, bring the conversation back up to modern times and uh, just kind of uh, get your get your opinion on what the spiritual position of the West is right now and. Uh, you know how how it's different from just the usual fuckery of of just you know foolish people trying to keep a spiritual system going. And uh, what, if anything, do you think uh, would be a good approach to uh, rectifying the situation? So I think there's a few schools of thought on that. One of the most common kind of mentalities now is the spiritual position in the West. If you believe in anything spiritual, you must have some mental condition that that, that we can find in the DSM manual. That's one one take on it. Another is um, just really stupid, like biblical literalism you see in a lot of Protestant groups. Or then you get the other, that's like one half, actually, I think it's a shrinking, probably not even half now. The other half of Protestantism or the other portion of it, it's like the ultra liberal, you know, it's just like the, you get all these churches now flying rainbow flags and yeah, just trying, yeah. to, trying yeah, to suck yeah. up to every little progressive trend, you know, of, 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 the, of the next six months that rolls along. You yeah, get so a lot of that. This has taken over the gospel, really. Right. So or what's my, the point of going to church when the things that are being talked about at church, you could just turn on the TV and they're talking about the same thing. Yeah. You know, you, you can get your same sermon on CNN or reading a BuzzFeed article. You know, you don't need the, you don't need the pastor for that. Yeah, the pastor, his name is Bob. You know, he, he yeah. works in real estate when he's not uh, when he's not giving sermons. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you get a lot of that. Uh, and then uh, there's the whole New Age thing. I don't know how strong that is still. Yeah, I think there's still some kind of residual traces of I that. There's definitely a subculture going. Yeah, that was kind of a, the burnout embers of the Theosophical Society from the late the late 19th century. That was all the rage back then. And then yeah, plus those... like, like spiritualism, that kind of thing too. Right, yes. And then it, it absorbed a lot of like the Hinduism of the hippie movement. That's right. Yeah. That's when that whole movement after the Theosophical Society kind of went down the dumps in like the 30s. 
Uh, then that whole thing got it's in the late 60s. It got legs again and then became, you know, new age and neo paganism and all these kind of like just modern fluff pop culture pseudo spiritualities. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess we're in a really messy. You've talked about this at length in your various videos and, and blog articles, but we're in a freaking mess right now. As far as the spiritual condition overall, and I think now with just the current events that are going on now, I just think there's just a state of both like mental, emotional and just cultural collapse going on everywhere. So yeah. I don't know how this is going to pan out right now, but I'm just, you know, just going to do my thing, study my spirituality and just avoid normal people. I guess that, that might be the. <laughs> yeah, sort of like the, uh, the hardcore conservative pagans of the late Roman Empire. You know, everything is just right. going to hell and they're just, uh, well, I'll just uh, keep doing the sacrifices and that kind of a thing and keep my head right. down. Yeah, hopefully some wandering bishop uh, henchman isn't going to notice me, you know, off on my farm, you know, safe distance away from town. I still got that little shrine to Athena still going yeah. strong, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of the, the main problem is there's just no vehicle for uh, like a, a spirituality with any kind of vitality and, and like uh, believability, acceptability, where, you know, you have to have some kind of narrative that holds it all together and it's just all falling apart. I mean, all, the only real narrative you've got nowadays is like the so-called enlightenment, which is ironically named and just uh, essentially uh, scientism. And even right. that's started to fall apart now because of um, the left has adopted postmodernism and the idea that truth is merely a cultural construct and everybody right. can have their own truth, which is just sort of balkanizing, uh, you know, the ideologies of, of the world. And uh, so I think it seems to me like our best bet, and it's not really a strategy just to wait for it to happen, but our best bet is for things to reach such a crisis stage that people are just desperate. And then you've got some... Uh, like charismatic inspired teacher who who steps forward and uh, starts teaching something that we can't even imagine what it's going to be. But I doubt that it's going to be any yeah. established religion or if it is any kind of established religion, it's going to have to be a, a very new and radical new form of it. Oh yeah, definitely. I think you're definitely right about it. it's some, some charismatic figures is going to rise up from the woodwork or wherever. And suddenly, you know, suddenly the world won't be the same or at least start part of it here yeah and there does have to be a certain amount of crisis and instability and chaos and like uh, liminality in order for that to really be possible like i've read uh, the buddha lived in a time of just great social crisis there was uh um it was like old like oligarchic republics were starting to collapse and being replaced by expansionist kingdoms and they had just made the transition into like a money economy. And so you had this new sort of capitalism, people that were rootless living in the cities. And there was just all this social chaos and ferment going on that um, somebody like the Buddha could really strike traction. I mean, there could there could be like really inspired teachers, all, you know, at other times that uh, it's just the time isn't ripe. Like, yeah, example, it's like. I consider the power of now by Eckhart Tolle to be more profound than most holy scriptures. You know, you compare that to the Old Testament and you wonder why it is that the Old Testament or the Book of Mormon are considered to be holy scriptures where, I mean, you have to really search for any actual wisdom in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, I think that's definitely right on. Uh, but yeah, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? It could be next year. It could be in five years, 10 years. What I want to do, though, is help create a, a fertile spiritual environment, you know, even just like a little think tank on people who are interested in this kind of stuff. So when like somebody does arise, there might be some, you know, some interesting ideas to work from rather than just say some some, some really another really horrible religion coming along. That's also another possibility. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think that is a good idea, and uh, we've actually uh, started taking some steps in that direction. Just uh, yeah, getting together like-minded people to uh, kind of set up some sort of platform. Yeah, no, I I, th I think that'll be great, and especially the stuff I'm working in. I think there's people who are into the same stuff I am, and a lot of the public stuff succumbs to a lot of the, the same leftist infiltration and just general dumbing down and like perversion of the core doctrines so there's gonna be a lot of people looking for a more 
something more true to the original texts and tradition and, and, and the original teaching lineage than just all the just crap that's circulating now. Yeah, my, my approach towards Buddhism is similar to that. I mean, you can't just cling rigidly to an ancient Indian tradition because we're not in ancient India and it's just not going to fit. But um, you, just to say, well, the Buddha didn't really teach that because it's sexist or something. I mean, that's not going to work either. So if you're going to adopt some kind of Buddhism or whatever the tradition is, I mean, you have to, first of all, say this is what the, the original tradition said. And uh, we're not in a position to follow this or that just because it doesn't fit the society anymore. But I mean, we can't just say, well, the tradition didn't really say that because it doesn't fit the society. Because that's, I mean, that's just, uh, you you kill the tradition doing that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a other huge problem now with, you know, any of these, any of these spiritual movements now, just this, this relentless revisionism. Yeah, progress. Progress. Yeah, the Church of Progress, which I think is actually collapsing. That's another part of the progressive religion. It's both material, you know, technological progress and social progress that nobody can explain. Nobody can say who is the great sage who got us enlightened into the modern era. Nobody can nobody can trace Mark. that. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, that's becoming a more popular again. I don't know. I don't know how much more traction that'll gain. But yeah. Well, that's easy to point out too. You just look at the lifestyle. Uh, what, how did Marx actually live? And you, you know, the guy was just a complete, complete scoundrel who mooched off his friends, and they didn't even impregnate his maid or something. And then she wanted him to like help out with the kid, and he, he told her to go screw off. Yeah, yeah, he was not a very nice guy. There's, yeah. there's a few like that. Let's, I used to worry that I'd become like a, a like a, a modern day Schopenhauer, you know, where. Yeah. He had some really profound ideas, and I'm not saying that Marx did, but Schopenhauer had some really profound ideas, but he also was just a capital S scoundrel. Yeah, he was a bit of a, I guess, a bit of an asshole. Some yeah, philosophers that's... tend to do that. That was the reputation Heraclitus had, by the way. He, oh, had, he spent half his time bad-mouthing other philosophers. Yeah, I mean, that it seems to me that that is like uh, how you test the validity of a philosophy. I mean, does it make a person like a, a better and happier person? Yeah, that that really is. The, I think that really is the test. Do, do so. Do the abstract principles somebody claims to to profess to believe in? Do, does it manifest outwards, or is it just all it's all talk? Yeah, all just theory, unapplied yeah. theory. I know. I see that a lot in people. The tiny Hermetic and Neoplatonist circle. They get some people with blogs. You could tell just by reading it. They just they don't apply any of the ideas outwards. It's like they're talking about all this high flute and platonic philosophy, and then the next post they're just agreeing with whatever all these just pro progressive pet issues of the day. It's like obviously there's just a complete disconnect here. You know, it's just not the ideas are not fully processing deep. Yeah. So I guess uh, the answer to the big question as to uh, what is to be done is uh, we just mind our own garden and then wait and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the best way best way forward right now. Yeah, I mean it's like uh, you, when you're living in hard times as part of the philosophy, and it's something you have to put into practice and not just talk about. Is just you have to face adversity with uh, equanimity and fortitude, and I do think that that like some sort of Neo Stoicism or Neo Cynicism would would possibly go well in the West um, if people became desperate enough, if times got bad enough. But yeah, so we can't yeah. just hope for that. Hope is not a strategy. Yeah, no, no, you get to do do something or other. You know, even it's just improving your own little sphere, your own little sphere of reality. Yeah, by helping yourself, you help others, and by helping yep. others, you help yourself. It's the opposite of the leftist mentality. You have to change the world first before you. And well, if you ask them to change themselves, you'll get, you know, they'll, you get accused of like probably, fifteen different, ists and, ics and isms and, and, yeah. and all that. 
Yeah, but I, I'm I'm more in agreement with like Dostoevsky, and a number of people have said the same thing that I mean, you're not going to prove the world through social reforms or changing laws or changing economic systems. I mean, I lived in Burma when it was a military dictatorship, a brutal and incompetent one, and uh, still I was I was under the strong impression that the average Burmese villager who was living with no electricity and no running water, earning maybe the equivalent of one U.S. dollar per day as as their their wages still they had less suffering in their lives than the average city dwelling american in a so-called free society because yeah of attitude i mean they were they were buddhists they were devout buddhists who took it seriously and they realized you know the, the second noble truth is all suffering is is uh, caused by desire you know it's all ultimately self-inflicted and i mean they took it to heart they didn't always you know remember it you know everybody you know, wants to blame somebody else for their bad mood or their unhappiness sometimes. But uh, still, I mean, they, they took it to heart much more than, than people in the West do. And also just because they were poor, I mean, they had less mammon to serve. So, you know, it's like your only other option is God, so to speak. And they just had fewer desires. And if, if all suffering is caused by desire, then you reduce the number of desires you got. You reduce the amount of unhappiness. But uh, in the West, it's uh, if, if you're unhappy, you have to blame somebody else preferably whitey yeah somebody with more more material resources since the operate operating systems materialism it's whoever has the more material stuff and if you can associate a skin color or uh, the genitalia with the having more stuff than great more fuel for the fire but yeah people here in the west are miserable miserable now and it really calls into it it calls into question the assumption Modern Western people just assume that well-being equals material well-being, which we can yeah. see that's kind of the opposite, actually. Yeah, economics works that way. Yeah. But they just assume, they just measure, you know, how prosperous and, and, and like, well-being just through, like, uh, you know, average income or something like that. Yeah. If you point out how some third world villagers is probably, probably a lot happier than the average Western, then you're like, Oh, you're just tr you're trivializing their their suffering. Of course, the person saying that doesn't know what the word suffering really means. You know, they're they're just filtering out through their narrow materialist version of what they think suff suffering is not being able to have a five dollar Starbucks beverage every morning, and you know, yeah, not at driving a late model vehicle, yeah, you know. or not being able to vote or whatever. Oh yeah, that that yeah, being uh, politically dis disempowered. Yeah. yeah, you know, realize like there would be a lot less suffering if maybe if the voting pool was restricted to a more, uh, let's just say, wiser stakeholder element of, of society. Yeah, yeah, like the like the, the way the founding fathers had it organized, where it was like the people who had most to lose by the the if if their country went awry, then they were the people who were the best. Uh, to be involved in politics because, you know, they had more of a vested interest in seeing, making sure that everything is working well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that circles back to the old wisdom we learned from Athens that some of the philosophers of the time notated is that the, the logical conclusion of all democracy is the populace just voting themselves the treasury. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson said the same thing. Democracy fails when the masses realize they can just vote for free stuff. Yeah, free stuff until the free stuff runs dry, and then, then the then the, then you gotta pick up the pitchforks and aim it at the the magical generators of the free stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we've been going at it for more than an hour, so uh, well, I suppose we should uh, wrap this up. And I do appreciate uh, hanging out with you. And uh, yeah, my pleasure. I'm really interested in like the like classical pre-Christian Western spirituality. And you know more about it than possibly anybody else I've I've known. So it's been it's been enjoyable for me. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. I enjoyed this greatly. I'll be blogging on these on these topics uh, pretty soon. Oh, okay, good. So, yeah, I'll be, uh, be able to what should explain we my positions in detail. Like, what's what's that? the name of the blog? Oh, it'll. Um, I have the domain registered, so nobody's going to steal it from me. But it'll be Numinosophy will be the name of the blog. It's sort of a play on my own name here, in addition to kind of sort of the general spirit of, of what the main subject matter of it will be. So. All right. And you can do that, and I'll just uh, keep plugging Buddhism mostly. Sounds like a plan. Okay. 
Well, it's been good. All right. And I will stop the recording.